Well, hello, we want to welcome you tonight to the webinar. This is Waypoint uh, 55 webinar every month. We uh, try to provide a forum uh, uh, for leadership learning just to help you uh, us navigate ministry together. And we're really excited uh, about the opportunity that we have tonight uh, to have Brad Heifs uh, from Fresh Hope uh, mental health uh, and the church is the topic for tonight, uh, and I think it uh, will be a topic that you will find uh, uh, helpful as you minister to real need in your congregation. Uh, of course, we want to thank uh, so much our sponsors at Mid-Atlantic Christian University that make uh, our webinars possible, uh, and they're a great po uh, partner of ours, and we appreciate everything that they do. I uh, just want to be able to give you a couple of tidbits about some things that are coming up very, very soon. Uh, first of all, just coming up in a couple weekends, uh, the elders, uh, E2 uh, Effective Elder uh, folks will be with us in North Carolina and Virginia uh, presenting the, uh, their uh, Elders What's Next seminar, Thinking Forward to Move Your Church Ahead. Uh, that'll be Friday, October 25th at First Christian Church in Kernersville, North Carolina, and then Saturday, exactly the same program, uh, repeated uh, in Mechanicsville, Virginia on sa Saturday, October 26th. And you can register uh, at Waypoint uh, churchpartners.com. Uh, the last thing I want to share with you before we get into the webinar tonight uh, is again our uh, ICOM 21 and 21 campaign where uh, we uh, have the goal uh, to uh, through partnership with churches all across the region uh, to plant 21 churches uh, in 2021 as a result of the International Conference on Missions coming back to Richmond. We're excited about them coming, uh, but it's going to be a thrilling thing to be able to pass off uh, 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 healthy and large checks to individuals around the globe, and you're seeing the map there uh, for those projects. And again, uh, you can go to the website, uh, www.21and21campaign.com uh, to get all kinds of information uh, about that. Well, I just simply want to uh, uh, pause and pray for a moment and then uh, pass the baton uh, over to Brad. Uh, Brad Heifs is our presenter tonight. He's uh, been a pastor since 1985. He's founder of Fresh Hope for Mental Health Ministries, an author, uh, speaker, uh, and I think that you will be blessed by your time uh, as he shares with us tonight. So let's just pause and, and pray and ask God's blessing with us uh, tonight. Father God, we just thank you so much for uh, what you do and how you and our lives uh, just bless us in so many different ways. And Father, I just thank you for the privilege that we have tonight uh, to be able to consider ministering to people in all of our churches that are struggling deeply uh, with mental and emotional uh, issues. And so Father, just open our hearts and our minds to, uh, tonight uh, to be able to learn some very practical skills and opportunities to be able to minister uh, to those individuals in our congregations. Father, thank you for tonight. Bless us, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Brad, I'll pass it over to you and uh, looking forward to what you have to share with us tonight. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really glad to be here this evening with all of you and um, looking forward to just getting right into this. And uh, I worked all day on my presentation, so hopefully it will be helpful to all of you. As, um, as he said, um, we're Fresh Hope for Mental Health. Our website is uh, www.freshhope.us, which is like .com. And um, I have a question that I'd like to start with this evening. And um, the question is this, if nearly 50% of the people in your church and your community were homeless, would your church see it as a crisis? In other words, would your church become strategic in ministering to those in need and seeing it as a major issue in your community? Well, chances are, if this were the case, I think that the vast majority of churches, I'd be surprised if any churches wouldn't see the need to create some sort of um, ministry that would address the issues of the homeless. And um, so it's interesting because 
while this would be true of things that we can see, there's some invisible challenges and crises that people face. Yet, for instance, there is a crisis going on in every single church and community in our country today. It directly affects one out of five people and another 25% of the members of your church and of your community are attempting to love and care for those whom it affects. In other words, nearly 50% of the population is experiencing this crisis in one way or another. Yet many churches are just not addressing the crisis at all. I'd like to share a little short video with you about some of the statistics regarding this crisis. There's a mental health crisis in America today. Did you know that more people have a mental illness than have cancer, HIV, AIDS, heart disease, and diabetes combined? Yes, you heard that right. More people have a mental illness than have cancer, HIV, and AIDS, heart disease, and diabetes combined. It's truly a crisis. There's literally an elephant in the sanctuary, and yet no one's talking about it. It's time to talk about it. 19.1% of U.S. adults experienced a mental illness in 2018. That's 47.6 million people. This represents one in five adults. 16.5% of U.S. youth ages 6 through 16 experienced a mental health disorder in 2016. That's 7.7 7 million children and young people. The overall suicide rate in the U.S. has increased by 31% since 2001. Today, more people die annually from suicide than in car accidents. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among people ages 10 through 34 in the U.S. At least 8. million people in the U.S. provide care to an adult with a mental or emotional health issue. More people first go to their pastor with their mental health struggle than go to a doctor or a counselor or a psychiatrist or a psychologist combined. Yet only 3% of pastors feel equipped to address the issue. It is a crisis of hopelessness. And what is needed more than ever before is hope. And the church has the hope that is needed. I was going to try to show you my screen, but we'll just leave it simple so it's working. Um, first of all, uh, the whole issue of mental health can be pretty daunting as a pastor and in a church because what happens is you're um, dealing with, uh, well, to put it lightly, you're, you're dealing with not wanting to do any harm. How do you go about helping people who are hopeless? And yet knowing that the church has hope, but knowing also that there's these boundaries and very solid, uh, clear boundaries about that we aren't licensed as therapeutic clinicians that, uh, you know, how does the church do this? And so traditionally we've just kind of stayed quiet. Churches end up doing nothing. And yet 50% of the population is in fact um, experiencing something going on with mental health. In some cases, it's because um, they are providing care for someone they love. In other cases, it's because um, they themselves have a diagnosis. 25 years of research done on hope, and the church actually has the hope that people need. And uh, research shows that when people um, plug hope, um, or, or when hope is infused by faith, that uh, people do better, they get better faster, they stay better longer. And um, so that's what we've been doing in Fresh Hope for a long time now. And quite honestly, um, when, when we discovered this was about 10 years ago, um, I attended several groups that um, I went to after I relapsed. I have bipolar disorder. And um, after relapsing, I ended up really going thinking okay i don't know enough about my own disorder i'm going to go ahead and find out 
you know, more about it. I'm going to go to these groups. It's going to be helpful. And I'm going to come away knowing more. And um, actually, I came away sicker. Uh, it, I didn't find hope. I found hopelessness at the meetings. I, little did I know that um, usually what happens is the fact that people end up uh, simply uh, venting and just doing more and more venting all the time. And as they do that, um, they actually get sicker. And so what we did is we started a group that I wanted to attend 10 years ago. And since then, we've um, ended up with about 69 groups nation or nationwide. And then we're in four other countries. And what we do is come alongside of churches that want to start a meaningful, hope-filled um, mental health ministry of some sort in their communities. And in doing so, then um, we, uh, we come alongside of them, we help you, we train your participants, we, um, we not only train them, but we certify them, and then we give them ongoing uh, uh, support and help. And uh, we've had great success with it. The success that we've had is that 78% um, of the people who were hospitalized prior to our attending our groups have not been hospitalized since. Nearly 90 some percent of them who were suicidal have not been suicidal since. And as well as 98% of them say that it has encouraged them in hope and has become a very powerful tool for them in their recovery. Now, um, all of what we do within our groups and what we offer is all um, based upon very sound research and evidence-based research that others have done, as well as we have self-reporting evidence of what can be done. It's very simple. Uh, starting a Fresh Hope group at your church is very simple. In fact, if I'm talking to very many pastors to, in this uh, webinar, I would have to say it will help make your life easier than as opposed to adding things onto it. For instance, we have literally hundreds and hundreds of resources online that um, people who are experiencing a mental health challenge or attempting to love somebody who is experiencing a mental health challenge can um, access and pastors can refer people to those resources. We have podcasts, blogs, videos. Um, we have a book called Fresh Hope for Living, Living Well in Spite of a Mental Health Diagnosis. And those who um, would be interested in that, that's available on Amazon as well as we have another book coming out uh, that's called um, Holding to Hope, Staying Sane While Loving Someone with a Mental Health Issue. There is, um, both books uh, are the type of books that you can do in a group or a single person setting where you're reading it, and, but you're working through it as a workbook. And uh, so both of those work well for churches that maybe aren't ready to start a Fresh Hope group but instead might be interested in, um, uh, you know, having some sort of group that's time sensitive and what we call short-term intervention groups. And uh, the book can be done by anyone who isn't even a trained facilitator or anything like that. And a group just works through it. We've had a number of groups start that way where people have said, well, let's do this first to kind of test the waters to see and we'll go from there. And then they've ended up starting a Fresh Hope group. Um, our groups are ongoing. They, they are not like some. There, there's others that offer 17-week um, courses, um, et cetera, et cetera. But I've always said that if um, recovery could be taught in 17 weeks, um, AA would have been doing that a long time ago. It, it just doesn't work. That's not how adults learn. We learn by processing and talking about things and uh, talking about it at the right time. 
and not just a, an assigned kind of homework project and then everybody comes together and talks about it. So our groups are ongoing. We encourage our um, groups to always meet during the summer as well as during around the holidays because more people than not um, end up uh, experiencing frustration and uh, difficulties during the holidays. And uh, so what we, what we really do is that's our primary bread and butter. We do have team groups and uh, we are piloting right now a Christ-centered support group for those who have lost loved ones to suicide. And then we also have a 17-week curriculum kind of short-term intervention for those who have a co-occurring issues in their lives. For those who are watching, uh, down at the bottom of your screen, you ought to have a Q&A button. You can just click on that and uh, uh, type in the, uh, the, uh, uh, your question, and I'll share that with Brad. I have a couple people asking, Brad, uh, could you give uh, the titles of your two books uh, again? Sure. So, huh? Um, Fresh Hope, Living Well in Spite of a Mental Health Diagnosis, and that one's available presently on Amazon. The second one, the title will be, it's not printed yet, but it's in the editor. Um, we hope to have, it's with the editor right now, we hope to have that out to people um, by the end of the year. That's called Holding to Hope staying sane while loving someone with a mental illness. I uh, remember an occasion, and Brad, I shared with you earlier today, I remember an, an occasion when I was pastoring a church uh, near a, a, a local military base back during Gulf War I, uh, and I had a, a colonel call one day uh, and describe, he said, one of his soldiers who was hiding out in the closet and he was uh, 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 cussing more than normal, and he was carrying his firearm, he was drinking heavily, uh, and could I give him uh, some, some resources for that? Uh, and I kind of fumbled, and I didn't really have uh, resources that I could give him specifically for that. Uh, but then several days later, I realized, just kind of woke up and realized he wasn't talking about one of his soldiers, he was describing himself. And I decided right there and then, I never wanted to be flat-footed again. I wanted mm. some good, solid resources and help. Uh, and Brad, one of the things that I love about your ministry is not just being counseling-based, which that is so powerful, but really is, is about peer one-on-one -on -one support and helping through uh, this crisis and giving pastors uh, a, an actual... Uh, actual uh, opportunity uh, to uh, walk through this. I have a question here that someone asked, uh, uh, how long does it take to, uh, for the certifica uh, certification to complete to be able to lead a group? Perhaps you could point them uh, to your website again. Uh, mm -hmm. and I know there's a, there's a little tab you can click on that will tell all about the groups. And that is right. Um, if uh, somebody uh, wants to become a facilitator, uh, normally what happens is we say, great, um, where is the group going to be sponsored? Because our groups have to be sponsored um, by a church or a ministry, a local entity. And then we ask that they meet in a public place. They don't have to meet in the church. And it doesn't have to be a church that sponsors them. Some of our groups are sponsored by um, hospitals and uh, uh, one is sponsored by a homeless shelter. And once that happens, once we know that there's a sponsor, then the sponsors uh, let us know who the facilitators will be. And then we train the facilitators through three hour sessions that they can do online. And um, there's three little quizzes. Now we are going to start after the first of the year, start training our um, facilitators in person in larger groups. Like if we came out to Virginia and there were, let's say three or four churches that wanted to start groups, then we do it maybe 12, 15, maybe as many as 20 facilitators together. And then they'd have the opportunity to actually lead a group or practice leading a group 
within that setting. Um, but up to this point, we've been doing it where they watch videos and uh, there's a little quiz at the end of each hour. And um, so there's not a ton of training uh, it, when it, you know, and then we certify them. And then uh, the facilitators get all kinds of resources. There's about a hundred and some cards that they could use in order to lead topics. Um, there's uh, videos that they can use. There's like, we encourage them to use one that's called um, Bootcamp 101. And, um, it, or Mental Health Bootcamp 101. It's an actually a uh, 12 week series um, as the first three months of their group. And each uh, uh, top or each one has a short video that the group watches and then discussion questions and things like that. We also are there constantly for the facilitators. If they have questions, they can contact us. And um, we are hoping to work with the Association of American Christian Counselors. Um, I, uh, the president and I have gotten in touch with each other and the potential of having therapists that are locally uh, close by for each of our group facilitators so they can uh, consult uh, a therapist if they need some advice or insights as to how to handle things. Um, within our groups, we have both the loved ones and those who have a diagnosis. So everyone is in the group uh, together, which really helps. We're the only people that do that in the country, even with secular support groups. Um, and the reason that I believe that's important is there's things that um, somebody can hear that a spouse has been saying for years or, you know, uh, maybe a teen hears another parent say about, um, or a young adult, um, and suddenly it dawns on them that maybe this isn't just mom and dad uh, feeling this way and maybe I need to listen and hear. The second half of our meeting then is uh, we do separate the loved ones from those who have a mental health diagnosis. At Fairmount Christian Church, where I'm a member of Fairmount in uh, Mechanicsville, uh, our connection with Brad actually came through uh, Charlie Thomas uh, at Fairmount, uh, who uh, uh, he and his wife have started a, a Fresh Hope uh, group at Fairmount Christian Church. And um, uh, let me give you their email address. You could uh, connect with them to find out more about that. Their email address would simply be Fresh Fresh Hope at FairmountChristian.org. Fresh Hope at FairmountChristian.org. Um, uh, Charlie, let me just ask you, uh, how long uh, has your group been up and running? I think they're a year to two years old, I believe. Okay. May 2019. 2018, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they are our um, regional ambassadors for Fresh Hope. So they are exactly the people that you need to contact if you live out in that part of the country. Now, we have four webinars that uh, would be great for any ministry leaders. And uh, those four webinars, um, like one is how your church can help people access mental health services. Another one is how to preach about mental illnesses. Another one is the Bible and mental illness. And uh, the other one is what I wish my pastor knew about mental health. And uh, that those are all on our website, as well as all the blogs and everything. Now, if you're interested in starting a group, um, you would want to email Nicole at freshhope.us. And that's also who you want to email if you'd like to have the PowerPoint um, and all of that kind of stuff um, and the brochures that I was talking about. I'd like to show a video to all of you if you don't mind. I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have fresh hope. I'm just, I'll be honest with you, I don't know. I, quite honestly, I don't know if my marriage would have made it without fresh hope. 
I couldn't be the wife I am today. I couldn't be the mom I am today that I want to be. I couldn't be that without finding hope. And fresh hope is where I found it. The beginning was quite simple. One man with a mental illness started a hope-filled support group in the basement of the church he pastored, believing that hope infused by faith was key to living well. 17 people met on a cold Tuesday night in February for the first time, and the ministry of Fresh Hope was born. Little did that one man know that many others were looking for that same faith-infused hope one by one, other groups started. And today, 10 years later, Fresh Hope has grown from one group to 69 groups in 25 states and four countries. The number of Fresh Hope groups has grown by 38% in the past year alone. Each week, our groups reach around 1,794 people weekly. Annually, our Fresh Hope groups deliver over 93,000 supportive, hope-filled contacts with people. Consistent weekly support that is changing lives. And just within the last months, Spanish-speaking groups have begun, and all of Fresh Hope materials are being translated into Spanish, which opens Fresh Hope up to million more people. Hi, my name is Samantha, and I'm from El Salvador in Central America. I honestly don't know where I would be without Fresh Hope. The Lord led me to the online group and He transformed my life and my family's life. Fresh Hope offers hundreds of free online resources. Presently, we have over 12,000 blog readers. We've trained over 800 church leaders through webinars and conferences. And we have over 50,000 podcast listeners from 25 countries. 10 years of offering real healing, real hope for real people. that gives you an idea. Um, and uh, quite honestly, um, you know, the, the thing is, is that we really do, in spite of this presentation, know what we're doing after 10 years. Um, and uh, the reality is, is I don't think most churches have the expertise churches kind of make the assumption, oh, we need to hire therapeutic counselors. Well, they can't afford that. Um, they, then the others think, oh, we need a whole bunch of training and we need to do this so we don't do any harm. Well, really, some of the most basic things, some of the most simple things your church can do is to just normalize mental health challenges. Talk about them like you do any other the issue. If grandma has cancer and you pray for her, pray for the person who's in the hospital with depression. Um, if, you take, if you take a casserole to somebody because they've been in the hospital or somebody had a baby, do the same for those who are suffering from mental health issues. And just normalizing it uh, can make all the difference in the world. And we're willing to help you in any way that we possibly can. And uh, there's many different ways we can. Uh, yes, Brad, we have a, 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 always we have groups of people that will be looking at one computer screen. And we do have a Bible college class that is looking in with uh, Bill Gilliland, uh, who's over in Covington, Virginia. And he asks, and it may be one, uh, uh, one of his students or maybe uh, himself, what are the primary mental illnesses that are addressed by the groups? We address any and all. Um, we have people with schizophrenia, people with bipolar disorder, people with depression, anxiety, personality disorders, you name it. Um, and some have co-occurring um, issues where they have both a mental health diagnosis as well as an addiction issue. 
an, another question. How do you keep the groups and facilitators on the pastoring side of the line without crossing into the psychological practice side of the line? You have to understand that our groups are peer driven. So it isn't pastors teaching our groups. It's not ministry staff people, but peer to peer support ministry. And this is where I, I fear that uh, the church does not understand that all across America today in the mental health field, there's all kinds of research today that shows that a peer led group and peer support that where there's uh, fundamental principles of recovery, that it is as effective as therapeutic clinical um, counseling is, and in some cases, more effective. And the reason is, is because those of us who have a diagnosis, I myself having bipolar disorder, I can speak to other people who have mental health issues and what I say carries weight, it, it, you know, um, and the bottom line is, is AA has understood this for many, many years. Otherwise, in, in the whole area of mental health issues, if people only depend on their doctor and a counselor, a paid counselor, which is fine, we would say people need their medicine, they need their doctor, they need their therapist, but ultimately, if that's all they depend on, then there's a learned helplessness. There's a part of not knowing how to live life well in spite of these things. And so um, the mental health field and clinicians as a whole um, respect this fact because if, if the case was, first of all, we don't have enough clinicians to help everybody who, who has need. Secondly, if they were, if it was totally effective, the statistics would not be going the direction they're going. The reality is that the missing piece has been, has been all along, peers saying to peers things that only peers can help each other with. And so what we do is help the people say, okay, here's your medicine. Yep, work with your medicine. Now learn how to live well. Here's the practical things from others who are living well, here's how we go about it, here's how we do it. And so you're not providing therapeutic anything, you're providing practical insights into how to live well in spite of having a mental health diagnosis. And then you're teaching people how to plug their faith in and, and to understand hopelessness is when you don't see a way forward. That's what 25 years of research shows. And um, what we do is help people see the way forward. And uh, the way forward is very practical. Uh, just as when my wife found out she had breast cancer, there was somebody there that had breast cancer before and they were her peer companion through all of it. Well, who did she lean on the most? It was that person. And so that's what we do. And we are getting ready to, um, after the first of the year, we will be training hope coaches for people. And churches could contact us and have us train up 5, 10, 15, 20 hope coaches. And hope coaches will be trained to do three things and to do them exceptionally well. Number one is how to listen and make sure a friend is hearing their friend share their pain and their crisis. And secondly, um, they will be taught how to ask the right questions, um, not therapeutic questions, but the right questions to get people to process that will help them talk about their pain. And then thirdly, um, they will be taught how to speak hope into people's lives without it being toxic Christianity or toxic positivity, um, because that's the last thing anybody needs. I think we're very good in the Christian church at keeping people from being able to process their pain. We just keep a little faith on top of it and some nice trite Christian sayings, you know, um, God will never give you more than you can handle or, or he'll see you through this and God's a way maker and all of these. Yes, those are all true. Uh, well, the one is probably not true that he'll give you more. He will give you, allow more uh, for you he will allow things to happen to you that is more than you can handle. So you have to depend on him. I would say that's biblical. But 
the bottom line is, is that um, these are things that peers can do for peers and it is not therapeutic. And um, in fact, um, the therapists that we work with, the therapists that um, send their folks to Fresh Hope, uh, for instance, there's uh, nine groups in the Omaha metro area, and they are all thrilled to send their clients to Fresh Hope groups because um, we are very positive, hope-filled. We work along with the clinicians, but also we are able to look at each other and say, you know what, that's really not a mental health issue. That's bad behavior or that that's stinking thinking. And, uh, you know, you need to uh, step up to the plate here or whatever. Um, if I could close with one thing that's very interesting, the Healing Trauma Institute of the American Bible Society found out 18 years ago they were um, taking the gospel into uh, countries like Rwanda and other places like that. And they found out that people weren't responding to the gospel. And they just, they, they weren't seeing much response. Well, the reality was these folks had so much trauma that it was actually impeding their ability to absorb the word, you know, and the word has to come through our brains. The Bible says it is through hearing that faith comes. Well, if your filtering system of your brain is all clogged up and mushed up with pain and hurt and uh, trauma and, and mental illness itself can be very traumatizing or your family member you're going through, it doesn't just have to be the mental health trauma, but any of those things. Well, I'll tell you what, if we all have to have a clinician do that for us, um, we're going to be in a load of trouble. The Bible says we can bear one another's burdens. There's, there are things that we can do that are going to enhance the therapeutic quality of people's lives. And we're, we've got to help people to get past this learned helplessness perspective. And um, really, it becomes a very functioning role of being somebody's friend and knowing how to do it well. Uh, Brad, I just want to say thank you so very much. And, and uh, I, a phrase that I will oftentimes use is uh, every church wants to describe themselves as a friendly church. But the reality is I'm not so sure that people are looking for a friendly church. I think what they're looking for is a friend in their church, which is what you're talking about. Right. And that is so very, very solid. Well, brother, I want to say thank you for working through the adversity. And uh, I, for one, uh, will say uh, that what you presented and shared with us was dynamic and powerful. Uh, and so don't fret the technology issues. Uh, you came through strong. Uh, individuals, uh, if you can uh, email Nicole at freshhope.com. Uh, no, dot .us. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Nicole at freshhope.us. Uh, and she will gladly send you that PowerPoint. Uh, and please go uh, to uh, the website, uh, freshhope.us, all sorts of resources, information, how to start a group, how to make connection. Uh, and I just would love to see uh, a number of groups being added to Fairmount here in Virginia, North Carolina, across the Mid-Atlantic. That would be so powerful. Uh, well, I want to just uh, be able to close out by sharing uh, a, a couple things coming down the pike for us. Our next webinar is going to come up on uh, the 11th of November, uh, and it's going to be uh, entitled Embracing His Presence, and just talk about some tested strategies for welcoming the Lord to your place as you worship together on, on Sunday. And then uh, in December, uh, on the 9th of December, we're going to learn from some of our, our of our church plants about how to do community outreach events that just really work. Well, again, I want to say thanks to uh, our friends at MACU for sponsoring uh, our webinars. We couldn't do this without you. We thank them so very much and thank all of you for uh, joining us tonight on the web webinar and Brad especially. Thank you for your presentation this evening. I just pray that you... Mm -hmm. All will have just a blessed, blessed evening, uh, and God bless you. Bye-bye.